Star Wars Outlaws story trailer now has the privilege of calling itself the worst dislike ratio on YouTube for the year. And if you look at that on the surface, you might think, why? Why is it getting so many dislikes? Isn't it just a Ubisoft open world game, but set in the Star Wars universe? That doesn't sound that terrible. And you'd be right. It doesn't sound terrible. But what's terrible is everything that surrounds it. There's a lot of Ubisoft's patented bullshit that is being peddled here, including in how it's being sold, how content is being stripped out of the game in order to sell it to you, how they are doing a lot of things that people don't like, from season passes to early access to the game if you purchase the more expensive editions of it. But there is something much more insidious going on here about what Ubisoft wants to do, what is their game plan, what they have been doing for a long time, and how we are watching a developer that has been good, that has made some excellent games, slowly self-destruct, sabotage itself as much as they can in order to ruin themselves. Just destroy their reputation bit by bit by making anti-consumer practices that they are misguidedly believing are the right decisions in order to be successful financially. So I'm going to dig into all of that. I'm also going to dig into the actual previews of the game and if there is any hope for this game to be good based on the actual game outside of those terrible business practices. And I'm also going to clear up some of the misinformation of some of the hate campaigns that have sprung out of the more legitimate criticism that there is towards Star Wars Outlaws. So hi, I'm Mug Thief. welcome to the channel, let's get into it. Now to set the stage, Star Wars Outlaws is a new Ubisoft open world game set in the Star Wars universe with the protagonist Kay Vess, which is an outlaw, as the name might suggest. It takes place between episode 5 and episode 6, so there's already a little bit of nostalgia baiting going on there. And just like Ubisoft is a, a machine of multiple sides, we really don't know the supervision of, of Lucasfilm and of Disney in what direction or how much creativity, how much freedom they're really giving this story to breathe or to go in different directions. We don't know if this is going to be Ashoka or Andor. That's really the, the thing. And, and they are very much in charge of a lot of that. They really want to protect the IP and that sort of stuff. But the setting itself, the, the idea of this game, I think, is very solid. It's just a big question mark how it'll come out. What isn't a big question mark is that pricing model. This is a game that retails for $70 and has a $110 Deluxe Edition and a $130 Ultimate Edition. And behind those editions, we have some of the worst practices in games. We have three-day early access if you get the more expensive editions, which really just means that if you don't get those editions, you get to play the game late, despite plopping down $70 for it. We have the Jabba mission that's included in the game that is locked behind that deluxe edition, meaning that it's there, it's in the game, and it's being cut out for you to pay more for it in order to access it, even though it is there. Ever since Street Fighter Cross Tekken sold us characters that were on the disc, Day one DLC for things that are on disc is just horrible. One of the worst practices. I mean, we got two for two on some of the worst practices so far. And not only that, but they are tying it to Jabba, which they know that a lot of people that are going to want to play a game about the seedy underbelly of Star Wars want to interact with Jabba. And even if at the end it's just like a dumb side mission and Jabba is involved in the main storyline and you will interact with him, the fact that they're putting it on the box of telling you, hey, if you want Jabba, you should pay more, is really scummy. It feels like they're just taking advantage of people, and nobody likes that. And of course, it also comes with the season pass. Not only is this just a ridiculous price increase over previous premium or gold editions of games, it's really scummy in how it's actually selling this to you. But that is not the problem. There is a larger problem here that we need to talk about of what Ubisoft has been trying to do and how it is borderline anti-consumer, but more than that, how it's self-destructive. And that's that they don't want you to buy Star Wars Outlaws. They do not want you to buy this game or any other Ubisoft game. And that's because there's a fourth box in the options to purchase this game 
and that is that you get the ultimate edition with all of the things that they've decided to lock behind paywalls, everything included for $17.99 if you subscribe to Ubisoft Plus. Isn't that a bargain? Well, that's what they want you to think because they are inflating the price to ridiculous levels to increase the perceived value of the game, specifically to increase the perceived value of that Ultimate Edition as much as possible to convince you to get Ubisoft Plus. And then hopefully you'll forget to unsubscribe or you will enjoy the game enough to then say, well, I'm going to wait for the season pass before I cancel and I'm going to play through that season pass content that comes with my subscription. And hey, by the time the season pass is over, Assassin's Creed Red will be out. So you're just going to stay on the subscription. They really want to hook you into it. And the problem with that is that Ubisoft Plus is the most expensive gaming subscription available and the one that undoubtedly provides the least amount of value. When you compare it with something like PlayStation Plus, which I mean, it, yes, online play is gated behind you having PlayStation Plus, but the upper tiers come with a lot of different games. Game Pass, still to this day, some of the best value that you can get in gaming for the price. A service that constantly updates with new games. Every two weeks, you get five, six new games that you can play on Game Pass. And it tries to really justify that value to such a degree that Microsoft, to make sure that Game Pass is the ultimate value, keeps hoovering up companies like Activision Blizzard in order to put more games on Game Pass, not just permanently there, but on day one. Even EA Play is much cheaper than those other subscription services because EA understands that despite having much more successful live service games out there and even having a larger output of games overall compared to Ubisoft, they can't compete with the amount of value that Game Pass and PlayStation are putting out at different levels. And Ubisoft instead thinks that they can compete by charging more. And they try and justify the ludicrous price point with how they inflate the value of their games. I think I'm painting a pretty clear picture of how Ubisoft continues to sabotage itself. On PC, you're locked to Uplay. They don't know what Steam is. They don't care. They want you to play through Uplay because then they can push Ubisoft Plus more. They believe in this subscription service as the future, and they believe that, for some reason, that consumers enjoy having to juggle 15 different subscription services, because they also seem mistaken in thinking that they are competing with other gaming subscriptions when they're not. Every subscription under the sun is competing in value of people's time in exchange for how much they pay for that subscription. So they are competing with Amazon Prime and Netflix and HBO Max and whatever other subscription service you can think of. And they are offering some of the worst value for it while not promoting their games outside of that ecosystem. And it's worse than a company just being anti-consumer because it's a company that can make good games. It's a company that has tremendous talent. They are a really big part of the gaming sphere and they have been trying to destroy themselves for so long instead of just getting their head on straight and just following more standard practices and making good games. And then on top of that, we need to talk about Ubisoft's reputation, which I already said that, hey, they still make good games. They still try from time to time. And I would love for them to try more and be successful in some of those good games instead of just continuously making mistakes. But the general perception of things like when Yves Guillemo says that Skull and Bones is the first quadruple A game, or when they say that gamers need to get used to the idea of not owning their games. You know what's interesting about that quote is that we don't own most of our games as is. We don't own the digitally downloaded games we have on our PlayStations and Xboxes or Steam, but we do preserve a sense of ownership and there are people fighting to preserve that concept of ownership, of having discs contain 1.0 versions that just work without an internet connection of having games that are DRM free and work off of a pen drive executable of things like good old games. We have people like Ross from Accursed Farms with Stop Killing Games, link in the description below to his video and to that project that are actually using Ubisoft as an example to chase legal action for game preservation. And by the way, that's not because Ubisoft is the worst game company that is delisting games and taking away the games you own. Many companies are doing it. 
It's just that if Ubisoft were an American company, we couldn't touch them. But because they're French and the European Union is a whole different ballgame, they are open to actual legal action that can have important consequences around the world. And, but this is a very important project with very real impact that if you own the crew in any capacity, check out the link and go support Ross over at Accursed Farms. But the problem with that quote of you need to get used to not owning games is not because it's not the, the truth these days, it's because they want to push subscription services. It's because they want to chase a business model where that ownership is even more blurred. And now they are taking every measure possible to push that subscription service onto you instead of you just buying a game that is well made and that you can play. Now, we also have to talk about some misinformation because there's been some big YouTube videos, some big tweets. There's been people saying that this game requires an always online connection to play it despite being a single player game. And that is just patently false. The game requires an internet connection to install the game. So if you were playing digitally, you wouldn't even know because you, you still would still need the internet to download it and the package you would get at the end is already functioning. Once the game is installed, you can play it offline. That has been confirmed. The only issue here is that if you buy it on a disc, you still need to connect to the internet to finish that installation process because games cannot be released in a finished state in 2024 because everything is terrible. But otherwise, no. You do not need to constantly be connected to the internet to play the single player game. I have no doubt in my mind that Ubisoft will attempt to do that to us not too far from now but not the case at this specific moment in time. Now let's quickly dig into the actual game. And I'm going to use Shinobi603 over on Twitter. He did a summary and analysis of Game Informer's preview. I read Game Informer's preview, but the bullet points here are just easier to digest. And I want to use this to really set expectations. I think that the only approach to a Ubisoft game of this size at this point is wait and see. But let's get, a, let's get a taste. Let's get an idea of what we can expect. Now, for starters, there's no towers to climb, no beacons to then ping the map and reveal different activities. That's gone. That's crazy. Like a Ubisoft game with towers is like saying water is wet. So this is just, hey, very encouraging. Good job. This is a good direction to follow. Aside from that, the previewer at Game Informer was actually quite positive on the game, and he said he was excited about how you can manipulate the various systems. And that sounds like a nothing burger, but I'm going to tie that in towards the end of this preview impression, because there's some hope to be had, you know, the last hope. But you will visit recognizable places, like, and you're not going to believe this, because this is a fan-favorite planet that we've always wanted to explore more of, but we've never, ever had the opportunity to explore more in-depth, be that in video games or in any other piece of Star Wars media, we're going to explore Tatooine. Gosh darn it, now, now you got me. I've never been to Tatooine. You also have Kajimi and uh, Akiva? Is it Akiva or Akiva? Uh, shout at me in the comments below. As well as new areas like the Moon of Tashara, which is created from scratch by Massive under the supervision of Lucas Game. Like everything in, in a Star Wars game, they have the final say on stuff. Very encouraging as well, the team focused on creating a compact, dense city experience with Miragana, which is Tashara's capital, instead of making big, expansive maps that are boring and empty. Again, this, this is very encouraging. We need more good maps that are interesting to explore, to move in, that have cool stuff to do, instead of maps that are big because they're big. Ubisoft has been trending in the making maps big because they're big for a while now. And uh, th this is good. This is encouraging. In this very dense city, there are shops, arcade games, betting areas, and sabak tables, which is the in-universe card game. And I was going to dunk on this by saying, damn, you put shops in your open world game? No way. Shops? Are you serious? This is, this is next level. But then I spent 30 hours playing Queen's Blood in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So I'm actually pretty excited to see what Sabak is like. Each city has a cantina, which serves as the central area for getting intel and finding work. Very standard, just a hub area. And everybody loves the cantina. The reputation system represents your standing with crime syndicates, and that reputation can range between terrible and excellent, which I'm pretty sure is what everything in life can range between. Having good rep with any of them can have benefits, like 
coming to your aid in the open world if you're in trouble, or offering special stock or letting you walk through their territory. Really, this is just peak 2008 open world design. Crazy stuff that we're seeing here. You can summon your creature companion Nyx, and Nyx can distract guards to make stealth easier. This is just watchdogs. Instead of a cell phone, you have Nyx. Using stealth can help avoid your reputation taking a hit if you go in and out of places undetected. Innovative, truly. And you can disable alarm systems and security cameras to avoid detection. <laughs> Are you serious? I can't, I can't believe it. <laughs> this wasn't a bullet point on Splinter Cell, but it's, it's a bullet point on Star Wars Outlaws. Also, your speeder can be summoned instantly, and it feels excellent and smooth to drive around. Which I don't know why Shinobi put that in quotation marks. I mean, that's just how the Game Informer guy described it. Now, here's where I actually want to be positive on the game. You can upgrade your weapons with new abilities to access new areas. And that sounds cool. That could sound maybe Metroidvania-esque. Uh, but the actual example in the preview is that you modify your blaster to have an ion, which is better against droids and allows you to shoot at a, would you call it, a thingamabob on the wall. And that opens a door from a distance that otherwise you couldn't open. And that doesn't sound that exciting. But if we combine that with the excited about how far you can manipulate the various systems in the game. If this game is an open world Ubisoft game with a higher emphasis placed on stealth, and we don't really get very many stealth games that are good at all anymore, right? Maybe the, le the last one that was really good was Ghost of Tsushima, and that's like stealth light. But if this game focuses on that and has more of an immersive sim design to its missions and its encounters and the different approaches you can take, to each of the different scenarios, uh, more in-depth than other Ubisoft games like Assassin's Creed or Far Cry, more of a, a, you're limited by your loadout and your reputation with the different gangs and the missions you choose and the options that you have in those missions are decided by the build that you choose and that'll give you more stealth or different pathways or different possible ways to solve missions. That actually sounds really cool. A Star Wars open world game that works kind of more like Cyberpunk 2077. Kind of more like Splinter Cell crossed with Deus Ex. Hey, that to me, that to me sounds like a winner. That that uh, That is something that I would actually be very excited for. But when you read through this entire thing, it also sounds like a very dated video game. That's not going to be very innovative or cool or, or even just, you know, ingenious and in how it blends together different genres or different mechanics that already exist into a unique experience. And like I said, I would like nothing more for this game to have that X factor, to have something that sells it to us, that really makes us want to play it despite all of that terrible bullshit I mentioned before. The wait and see approach wins once again, because this just doesn't read like a game that's, that's really pushing anything beyond, hey, it's stuff you've seen, but now it's Star Wars. On top of all of that, there's also been some controversy of people saying that KVS has been purposefully made ugly uh, because of reasons, I guess. I have that that to me just doesn't make a lot of sense. I think that some of those types of claims that we see around the Internet based on how games have been modified for certain reasons or another are are legitimate. There are concerns to be had, but I really don't see it here. What I do see is a character that is very clearly, uh, let's say, heavily inspired or legally distinct from Sigourney Weaver, but that also has a terrible hairstyle that looks like it's made of plastic. And the reason I'm talking about it is because I don't like how this impacts gameplay. I would like to change this horrible hairstyle. I would like to just give her Sigourney Weaver's hairstyle, please. And like a different jacket and boots and stuff. And that doesn't seem to be in the game, I don't like that. That is not cool. I know that Lucasfilm controls a lot of the canon and stuff like that, but we already got Jedi Survivor. We've had some pretty decent Star Wars games, to be honest. And in Jedi Survivor, while still creating a very distinct character that is very much who he is with Cal Kestis, portrayed by Cameron Monaghan, I can change his outfit, I can change his lightsaber, I can customize a lot of it, and uh, I can do that aesthetically as well. And not being able to do that with KVS, uh, that doesn't sit well with me. I, I think that we've already seen that we can have our cake and eat it too. Beyond that, I think that the lighting system in this game has some issues because there's some cutscenes, there's some screenshots 
where Kay Vest looks great. She just looks like Sigourney Weaver. And that's, uh, look, if you're going to get inspiration for an 80s inspired action hero for this retro aesthetic, this episode five, episode six aesthetic that you're going for, that's a great inspiration to have. But sometimes the lighting makes her look like legally distinct Sigourney Weaver. And sometimes the lighting makes her look like a demon from hell. And not just her. A lot of the characters. Don't know what's going on with that. But this game is close from release. That's not a good omen right there. So look. The dislikes. Very warranted for the bad decisions. But they don't mean that the game will be bad. It just means that the game will always contain bad stuff around it. In the business practices of it. I still want this game to be good. I'm still going to choose to be hopeful and hope that it's good because because it's a game that I want to play. I want to find out if this game is good or not. And I would much rather make a video saying turns out Star Wars Outlaws is nothing new, but pretty great than make a video saying, yep, the suspected dumpster fire is a dumpster fire because in that second scenario, I had to play through the dumpster fire. And that's not how I like to spend my free time. So I hope this video cleared up some of the information, storm, the noise around Star Wars Outlaws. I hope you came out of it well informed holistically of everything, including some of the stuff that I see people neglect or not talk about or prioritize other things. And if you like that idea, if you like news and coverage that cuts through that noise, remember to subscribe. And you can check out the channel for all of my other content, including my long form analysis, my long form critiques. Just give it a look. A big shout out to the $1 wall, the patrons that support me at the only tier available on my Patreon, which is $1. And that does support me in making these videos for you. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I will see you again very soon.